to talk about the righteousness of God. And sometimes when we look at the topic of righteousness, we wonder, well, what exactly does that mean? And what does it mean to us? This week I had a number of opportunities to talk with some people who were going through rough times. I know that there's nobody here this morning who are dealing with some challenges. The statement, though, I've heard many times before, but yet it stuck in my mind this morning or that, that day. I don't know what I would do without God. And then the person just looked at me and smiled, and I thought, yeah, I think that sums, sums it up so well. I don't know what I'd do without God. After living on this earth for almost seven years, my early years, I spent it without God, without knowing that there was a God who loved and cared for me, and without knowing all that God had available for me. And then I was thinking, oh my heavens, it's been 48 years since I've been a Christian. 48 years of walking with God and having God walk with me. And sometimes it's like a blind faith, isn't it? Like you just put out your hand and he walks with you. It's just there with you. And I just said, well, that's my testimony. I don't know how I would have done it without God. That's my testimony. And so I'll give you my, my verse. And I bore this from Judy all the time, because that was what her testimony was when we were younger. She always was willing to share a testimony. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. Trust the Lord with all your heart, and do not trust in your own understanding. Agree with him in all your ways, and he will make your path straight. And that's my testimony after 48 years. Here's a challenge for each and every one of us. Do we believe the Bible? Then are we using the resources that God is making available to us on a day-by-day -day basis? A daily basis. Every day there is something for us from the Bible. Isn't that true? And then after knowing God all the years, I can say that I trust Him. But I still need to grow. I don't know about you, but I still need to grow in my trust and my relationship with Him. That's okay. But there's so many ways and so many things that we can trust God for. It's not true. We can trust Him for direction, like the Bible verse said. We can trust Him to guide our lives. We can trust Him to give us a sense of calm or peace, even in the most turbulent of, of experiences that we go through. We can trust Him for strength, for encouragement, for support. We can trust Him for protection as well, too. And that's, in essence, what putting on the breastplate of righteousness is all about. Trusting God for protection. Let me share with you uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14. And this is from the English Standard Version. And I really like the way that it's put here. So because of this, you must take the armor of God that you may be able to stand against them in the evil day. And that you may be able to stand fast after you've done all things to stand, to which is your duty, stand with the with truth as a belt around your waist. Put on righteousness as a breastplate. I really like it the way it puts it there. Put on righteousness as a breastplate or protection. In the Amplified Version, it says, Stand therefore, which means hold your ground, having tightened the belt of truth around you, and having put on the breastplate of integrity, of moral rectitude, and of stand, uh, right standing with God. So we're going to look at it, and we're going to put all this together this morning. And the first question I want to look at is, what exactly is righteousness? What is righteousness? A lot of people these days have a really negative connotation or perspective on what righteousness is. And we have this thought that 
Righteousness, or people who are righteous, are people who walk around in sort of a monk's outfit. And, uh, you know, I have this vision of uh, people in uh, India who walk around with these long robes, and they sweep as they walk because they don't want to step on anything. They don't want to cause any harm to anybody. And so this is this idea of personal piety or personal purity, but that's not what it's all about. There's another idea that it's kind of like a, a, a mean librarian. Have you ever met a mean librarian? We had some nice ones. Okay, I want to get that clear. I'm going to put that out there right off the bat. But you know, a mean librarian, when I was in school, in university, in high school, and you'd be talking with somebody in a whisper, and they would have to shush you. Even though you're talking with really, shush. And then you would look over and say, no, shush. That's it. So we have this idea that we, we have to be perfect or we're going to get shush. In Jesus' time, many, not all of the religious leaders were self-righteous. And Jesus gives us the example in Luke chapter 18, or read that earlier on, about this self-righteous attitude where this person stands up to pray and he says, God, I thank you that I'm not like everybody else. And that's a self-righteous attitude. God, I'm good. And I thank you that I'm better than them. And he says, the person, the tax collector, he prays, please be merciful. I'm a sinner and I need you. And Jesus says, which one of these do you think God listened to? You, Which one of these do you think God heard? And he says, I tell you that this man, a humble man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humble, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted or lifted up. So self-righteousness is not the righteousness that we're talking about here. And righteousness, in fact, is one of the most pleasant personality characteristics that we could have as people. Some of the attributes of a righteous person are, and listen to this, first and foremost, they're humble. They're humble because they realize that it's not about them, it's not about anything that they can do, it's about God working in their life, right? And so they're humble and they accept that as a reality. They're patient, they're modest, they're, they're self-controlled, they're uh, gentle, they're kind, they're loving. Those are the attributes of righteousness. It's not the attributes of self-righteousness. So that's what righteousness is. But why is it important? Well, you see, the breastplate of righteousness is a protection. And it's standard equipment for police officers and for military that they would, they would have a, a, a protective body armor on them. Now, that picture there is a picture of the standard equipment for a Roman soldier. Now, I had to laugh when I was pulling out this picture and I went, is this to intimidate people? Because seriously, how many of us here can say that that's what we look like? And I fully believe that underneath their, cut, their armor, they didn't look at all like that. As a matter of fact, some of them would have a hard time really belting that on. <laughs> I'm just throwing it out there. They all stand there and they look very intimidating, right? Meanwhile, underneath, it's like a 98 per a pound person, you know? It's so jumping around. Anyways, and then I looked at the, uh, the uh, armor that <coughs> medieval knights would wear. And that was like from head to toe, literally from head to toe. As you can see that, it was very robust and it was very heavy. And I pity the horses. Yeah. When these people would sit on the horse, the horse goes, oh my heavens, can you take off a little bit of this stuff here? But the armor that the Romans would wear was very lightweight, and it protected all of the vital organs. So in essence, you could be injured, but not mortally. And they could say, hey, get back in there. 
Well, I got an arm missing. Get back in there. I got two arms missing. Get back in there. Uh, it reminds me of a show of Monty Python. <laughs> no arms, no legs. I'm still fighting. <laughs> Anyways. It's funny, but the reality is that this is what God offers us. He offers us a protection. And that's what the breastplate of righteousness is all about. It's a protection. Now, there are two forms of righteousness that are presented in the Bible. First, there's the personal righteousness, or the personal integrity. The Amplified Version talked about integrity, didn't it? And personal integrity is very important, but it's not enough. It's important, but it's not enough. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20 says, being righteous before others. So personal integrity is important. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 3 says, to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. So personal integrity is extremely important. And we have as a guide for that, we have the Bible. We have the teachings of the Bible, the teachings of, of Jesus. We have the Ten Commandments. And following these is extremely important because it makes us presentable. It makes us presentable. Now, for the men here, we all understand that's important, presentable, because you see, when we generally go out in public, I'm not going to go on that one. <laughs> when we generally go out in public, guys, some of you can relate. Have you ever, you know, you get dressed, you're ready to go, you're, you're about ready to walk out the door, and somebody says to you, there's a voice calling out and saying, are you kidding me? You're going to go out in public dressed like that? And of course, we look at them and go, yeah. Because we don't see any problem with it. You know, yesterday we were at the service and uh, I had a mauve uh, shirt on. And somebody said, oh, that was really good. Um, you know, you picked out really well. And I went, I didn't pick it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Judy. She dresses me. Therefore, I am presentable. And that's really important. Uh, for, for dads, too. How many times have you heard your kids say, Dad, you're not going to dress that. Now my, kid, my friends are coming over. What's wrong with this? Anyway. So, this personal integrity, this personal righteousness in that sense, makes us more presentable. I was reading just the other day, and of course, uh, nobody understands this at all, but the cosmetic industry has been evaluated at $374 billion U.S. That's about a trillion Canadian. All of that, and what is the purpose of it? To make us more presentable. Okay? That's why they put it on, is to make us more presentable. Uh, Judy the other day had her face on. <laughs> perverts his ways will be found out. Proverbs 11, verse 3. The integrity of the upright will guide them, but the crookedness of the treacherous will destroy them. Proverbs 28 and 6. Better is the poor who walks in integrity than he who is crooked, though he is rich. There's all sorts of Bible verses that remind us that personal integrity is extremely important. We also know that we struggle with it, right? Paul said it in Romans chapter 7, verse 19. He said, For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. So that's a reality about us. We want to be presentable. We want to walk upright and in integrity, and yet we struggle with it. That's one of the reasons why the breastplate of righteousness is important for us. And so we're talking about positional integrity, positional integrity. 
And positional integrity basically is this. I am in Jesus. I am in Jesus. Positionally. And he gives me integrity. He gives me his righteousness. And the beauty of that is that it is free and it is perfect because it's based upon his integrity. It's based upon his integrity. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you hear that? There is now no condemnation. That's what we're talking about, this positional integrity and the value of it. Plato was once accused of certain crimes. And his response was, well then, we must live in such a way as to prove that our Accusa uh, his accusations are a lie. Now that's important. That's, that's talking about personal integrity. And 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, Peter says that this is important. He says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits you. <coughs> so it's important, but at the same time, one person put it this way, if we're relying solely on our own personal integrity, then our shield is full of holes. Get it's full of holes. We have to rely on God's integrity. And why is it full of holes? Well, we have, who was it the other day said, Something, what I, I heard something about uh, Jimmy Cricket. Remember Jimmy Cricket? Always let your conscience be your guide? No. Because we have what is called sometimes an overactive conscience. None of you had to deal with that, right? It's called a pathological conscience. It's an unreasonable conscience, an unrealistic conscience. And it continually condemns us that we're not acceptable, that we're not good enough, that we're not right, that we're flawed. So we have a conscience going at us, and then we have uh, the accuser, Satan, coming at us, saying the same thing. You're not good enough. You're not acceptable. You're wrong. Look at you. Do it again. And if we're relying on our own integrity, if we're relying on our personal righteousness, it's full of holes. It can't protect us. That's why we need this positional integrity, this positional righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus. Because we can't stand even against our own conscience. And we need to fall back on something, don't we? And so when our conscience attacks us and says, you're wrong, you're flawed, you blew it, you made a mistake. Well, if we're relying on Jesus' purity, Jesus' righteousness, we can <coughs> say to our conscience, we can say to the accuser, you know what, you're right, I blew it. I made a mistake. I, I, I messed up again. But I've asked for forgiveness. And guess what? He forgave me. That's the beauty of it, right? We go to God and we make a mistake and we say, God, I blew it. You know, God doesn't look down and go, yes, you did. He's listening to us in love. You know, God, I made a mistake. I blew it. I've sinned against you. Please forgive me. And we're reminded in the Bible that what he does is this, he forgives us. He cleanses us. <coughs> And then if we want, he gives us this purity of Jesus. And the nice thing about the purity of Jesus is that there's no holes in it. Because it's based upon his purity. It's based upon his integrity. And so when God then looks at us, he sees us through the lens of his son Jesus. And when he looks at us and he goes, you're perfect. Now we look at it and go, no way. But he's going, you're perfect. That's how he sees us. Because he loves us. He cares for us. And that's why he makes available for us this breastplate of righteousness. Think about it like this. Years ago, there were two people who were walking the face of this earth. And they were walking along casually, stark naked. And I, was, I couldn't help but think, you ever say this to a group of little kids? And if you use the word naked, what happens? They start giggling. They start chuckling and giggling. Oh, they're naked. Anyways, sorry, I digress. 
<laughs> so these two people in the garden, called Adam and Eve, and they're walking before God in complete naivety because they have this personal, wonderful, close, perfect connection with God, the Creator. Now I have to understand something is that the garden, contrary to popular belief, was not located in the internet. Okay, because you're not going to do that, even today. I just want to clarify that. You see, they had this perfect relationship with God. And today, for us, through Jesus, we can have this connection with God. And we can have this forgiveness. And then He gives us this righteousness. And we can stand before Him and going, Yes, I made a mistake, but I asked God for forgiveness, and He forgave me, and He has cleansed me. And he accepts me as a king. Isn't that wonderful? John Newton. We know the story of John Newton, right? He wrote Amazing Grace. Love that song. He wrote over 350 hymns. Now, if John Newton had to stand on his own merits, well, forget about it. John Newton was the captain of a slave trading ship. He was, as we would call it today, involved in human trafficking. He had done some terrible, terrible things to make money. And yet, when he realized his need for God, and he went to God, and he asked for God's forgiveness, God did what? Hold it against him? No, he forgave him. And, and John struggled with this, but he kept coming back to this reality. God, through Jesus, forgives me. And God, in Jesus, gives me this purity that I could never have on my own. Amazing grace, how sweet it sounds. It saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And he wrote this other song, too. It's called A Debtor to Mercy Alone. Listen to this. A Debtor to Mercy Alone. That's a debtor to God's mercy. Of covenant mercy I sing. Nor fear with your righteousness on my person and offering to bring. The tares of the law and of God with me can have nothing to do. My Savior's obedience and blood hid all my transgressions from me. To get it? God's righteousness that Jesus makes available to us as a gift. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 22 it says, This righteousness from God comes from faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. We close with the words of this beautiful song. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest spring. That's trusting in feelings, right? The sweetest spring. But wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All the ground sinking.